All right. Welcome back, Father Robert Nixon, Thank fresh you. in from uh, Australia. And uh, we're continuing our conversation on the great spiritual master, the the, the blessed, the venerable Thomas Akempis. And uh, today we're going to talk about his uh, small work, humility, and the elevation of the mind to God. But why don't you open us up with a short prayer, and hopefully we'll get humble uh, while we pray. Lord God, you have commended humility to us. You told us that you yourself are meek and humble of heart. Help us to imitate you in your model of this wonderful virtue, this virtue which brings us close to true self-knowledge, which brings us to openness and humility to your divine will. We ask this through Jesus Christ, the Master of Humility. Amen. Amen. Well, that, that's that's a great prayer. The Master, Jesus Christ, the Master of Humility. Now, so this this was, was this the first work that you did with us? Humility. This was the second the work. Second the one. second oh, one. Oh, the first, first one was the Crown of the Virgin. The Crown of the Virgin. Yeah, yeah, yeah by Saint Aldephonsus, which we'll talk about yeah. at another time. Wonderful. But, but yeah, so this was the second one, and I, I have to mention uh, something I just mentioned to you right before we went. We we started recording that you very kindly dedicated this work uh, to the memory of John Morehouse, a wonderful and gifted herald of the gospel and dedicated servant of God, the church, and humanity. And my, you know, one of my best friends, he was our, he was the editor uh, at Tan Books for a number of years, and he uh, had a very premature death uh, in his early 50s, um, and he left five kids and a wife um, whom I'm still very close to. And so we, we, uh, we very much miss John Morehouse, but so thank you for dedicating this work to him. And John was a, actually... A, a very humble guy. He, whenever you were talking with him, it was never about him. It was about others. So, so anyway, just thank you for dedicating that to John. So. He was he was very encouraging, Connor, about this particular work. So uh, yeah, I felt it was fitting. Yeah, yeah, I miss him. I sure miss him. And uh, the John Morehouse Conference Room is actually the 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 boardroom that we meet in just down the hall. So um, anyway, his memory is alive and well around here. So okay. Humility and the elevation of the mind to God. Now, before I get into the content, I got a lot to ask you about that. Where did this work come from? I mean, he did yeah. not write a little book called Humility and the Elevation of the Mind to God, right? So how did you find this? So, and how did this so, get to uh, where so it is? So I, uh, you know, have the uh, collection of the complete works of Thomas Aquinas, uh, Thomas Akempis, and there are several editions of this, probably about eight Editions floating around. These are these are all Latin ones, which compile all his works together. And so I went through these very carefully, and I said, which ones um, are going to be useful for contemporary readers? Mm -hmm. And humility in its original format is is I mean it's quite a short work, and the, the elevation of the mind to God is a separate work as well. Right. So you uh, did combine uh, them together a little yeah. bit longer, but it seemed very fitting to combine them together. Yeah. Because humility provides us with the with the necessary first step, the preparatory groundwork for the elevation of the mind to God. So to couple these together, as well as some other uh, devotional prayers and writings. Seem to be very uh, fitting. Yeah, yeah. So our okay. Well, but I mean, was this a homily he wrote? I mean, like, what kind of was this ever bound on its own and sold before in Latin? Like, uh, how no, did he look, write these? No, things, uh, you know? look. It seems that he would have originally written this work as a kind of instruction for his for. For novices, okay. he was training for people. He was giving spiritual advice to. Um, sometimes he he wrote short works at the request of other people. Would say, you know, write to me oh, something about humility. Wow. So so it's like a compilation of of thoughts for that purpose. I see. And he wouldn't have been thinking about publication, of right. course, in his own lifetime. Works were generally transmitted by being copied by hand. Oh, yeah, yeah. This was just at the advent of printing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now the my favorite book that Tan publishes is a book called Humility of Heart. Oh uh, yes. And so it's 
my, I, I love the, the subject of humility. Um, and so anytime I see that word, I kind of, I kind of zo- zoom in and I've become convinced through this work and humility of heart, which is our, that was last year, it was our kind of book of the year. And we sold a ton of copies of humility of heart. Yeah. And the reason it's so important, um, I think you know, dovetails nicely into the very first line of this work. And I'll just read it. It says, quote, learn from me for I am meek and humble of heart. Now that's how this work begins on humility. It's my understanding, I think in the Gospels, the only time Jesus says, learn from me, yeah. is when he says this. Yeah. He doesn't say, learn from me, for I am wise. You know, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say, learn from me because I'm patient and kind. He doesn't say, he, I'm meek and humble of heart, right? Yeah. So that's kind of an incredible, an incredible thing for me. So, you know, what, what I took from that when, when I realized it was... We have to learn how to look at each scene in the gospel, each scene of the life of Christ, and view it through the lenses of humility, right? So the baptism of Christ, we need to say, what's the lesson in humility? Uh, Or go back to the incarnation, you know, where's the lesson in humility? The Last Supper, where's the lesson in humility? The Passion, of course, where's the lesson in humility? So, So I feel that this one line, how this book begins, learn of me. For I'm meek and humble of heart, Matthew 11, 29. It's, it's really, to me, Father, it's Christ saying, read all of the gospel stories through the lens of humility. I'm just curious what you think about that. I, I think that's very true. And, and this is something which we can easily overlook because in the, in the great events of the life of Christ, in, in the incarnation itself, in the baptism, here is um, Jesus Christ, who, the second person of the Holy Trinity, the uh, supreme ruler of the universe, the judge at the end of, da- of time. And here he is interacting with human beings, not only as uh, a teacher, but also as their servant. Yeah, yeah. And I think this is truly remarkable. It's a, it's a lesson which each of us can profit from. Yeah, you know, we think, how do we interact with with our fellow human beings, with the world around us? Do we come here as as a servant, who is someone who is who is meek and gentle yeah. and humble of heart? Yeah. And uh, I think I think you know, it's such a beneficial life lesson for everyone. Yeah, that's beautiful. The, the very first lesson I'm reading from the, from the first page here, the very first lesson of Christ is therefore humility of heart, for this is the foundation of all virtues and indispensable to the attainment of eternal salvation. So, you know, one, one thing that, that uh, kind of strikes me about humility is, you, you know, um, there's a lot of people in heaven, Father, that didn't uh, practice a lot of mortification because they they couldn't for some reason. There's a lot yeah. of people that didn't give away all of their money that are that are still in heaven. There's a lot of people who weren't virgins because you know they were called to the state of marriage. There's a there's all different kinds of people in heaven, but there's no one in heaven who was not humble to some yeah. extent here on yeah. earth. It's the one non negotiable, <laughs> you indeed, know. Indeed. And I guess that's why the saints. Uh, including um, a campus here, taught that humility is truly like the foundational virtue. So let's talk yeah. about it as like the foundational virtue. Yeah. So it's only through humility that we are able to encounter our true selves in relation to God. So the uh, human being in our fallen state, often we're, we're puffed up with ego and illusions and defense mechanisms And this makes us um, fail to recognize what we are in God. Uh, We are given by God this immense dignity of bearing his likeness and image. But also, we're we're tiny fragments compared to his Mm -hmm. immeasurable power. Mm -hmm. So our attitude towards God should be one of, of reverence, gratitude, obedience, and humility. Now, I would suggest that this attitude towards God is one which we should carry towards our fellow man Mm -hmm. as well, seeing in them the image of God, one of the brothers or sisters of Christ. Um, And 
this this then makes uh, every other virtue emerge naturally. So, so you know, I think the, the 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 church fathers speculate, and I just love this, and I just think it it ties right into humility perfectly. The church fathers speculate that the reason Lucifer fell from heaven is that he he the the, the idea of the incarnation, that second yeah. person becoming man, yeah. was was revealed to them. And Lucifer being the highest angel, like the most beautiful, Lucifer meaning light, you know, the angel of light. He says, no way in hell can I worship flesh and bone, indeed, you know? Indeed. I mean, this is going to be a crying, whining baby, yep. you know, who wets his diaper. I cannot worship that. I'm an angel, okay? And so Lucifer and the other angels, they take a nosedive straight to hell because they could not exercise that level of yeah. humility. Yep. And, you know, I mean— Okay, he's the devil. I'm not going to give him sympathy, but I can kind of get it. Like I see the problem there. I mean, they're as powerful as the angels are yeah. to say I'm supposed to, you know, to bow down before this flesh and blood. Just it yeah. is a it's it's yeah. a, it's a mind blowing uh, it, it, uh, exercise in humility on Christ's it, it, part. It is, and then is. the the devil and the angels, e- even lacking a little bit of humility, there was enough to cast them to hell. It, it is. Yeah, so pride, this uh, this refusal to submit fully to the will of God, was the sin which caused Lucifer to fall, which, yeah. which caused him to rise up against God. I think if we think about the story of Adam and Eve, also, uh, it is pride which is the first sin, because the devil tempts them by promising them, you know, to be more than what they are by saying, you know, you don't really need to obey God. So this failure in humility. We think about also, I think, individually, a lot of our what struggles in life, conflicts and so forth, they emerge from this sin of pride, yeah. this idea that we have to stand up, we have to make ourselves more than who we are, we have to defend ourselves against things. And um, I think a, a little humility goes a long way in establishing peace. You know, in terms of you mentioned Adam and Eve, and one of the things that I've reflected on and in one of my little books, is is that the when the devil tempted Eve, he was saying, if you eat this, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. So it really was this pride of, hey, I'm not content with what God made me to be. I yeah. want to be more. Yeah. I want to be more insightful. I want to be more beautiful. I want to be more popular. That's, I want to be more right. what, whatever it is. So like humility, in a sense, you know, humility is – accepting exactly what God wants of you yeah, and nothing yeah, more. Yeah. And it, in fact, another little book that we have, um, it's, it's, it's the book of the year this year, and it's my, probably my second favorite TAM book, um, Trustful Surrender to Divine Providence. Oh, yes. It's interesting, Father. It, the I find the most interesting part of that book is he says, true surrender even surrenders your own notions of holiness. So, you have to accept that, hey, maybe God didn't make me to be any more holy than this. Oh, uh, yes. Indeed, I have to indeed. accept that, hey, God made me to be a good person, but not a great saint. Indeed. And, and indeed. I have to accept that. Yeah. So it's like, again, it's the ultimate surrender is actually just humility. It's That's all it is. That's all our holiness comes down to, to a large extent, is is are we fully and completely accepting exactly what God wants of us? And we, we complicate the hell out of this by thinking about all the different virtues and all the different practices that are needed. But in the end, I think God's just saying, are you humble? Because that's yeah. what enabled Michael, the archangel to throw out the, the seraphim Lucifer from heaven. And it's what caused Lucifer to fall all the way to hell. It's the yeah. pride and humility question over and over again. Yes, to recognize that that all of our talents, our virtues and so forth are all a purely gift from God. Our existence itself is a pure gift from God. And in the context of this, you know, um, not to be um, not to be ambitious, even, even with respect to virtues and holiness. So we find ourselves often in a state of, you know, a, a certain level of holiness or devotion. And it can be pride which impels people to want to push themselves beyond this to reach to the next level. Yeah. Of course, we need always to be uh, to be aspiring, to be desiring this. But it's God who who gives us it, yeah, and He gives it in His own time, in His own way.
Now, I tell you, I saw you playing piano last night. If I could play like you, I'd be very prideful. <laughs> It was, it was <laughs> remarkable. You, our audience should know, by the way, that you are like world-class pianist. It was incredible. And I, I left there saying, I don't do anything as well as he plays piano. I can't brush my teeth as well as he plays piano. <laughs> like I can't do anything at an expert level like you do piano. But anyway, so I, I guess that – but you, you seem to retain the virtue of humility quite well, even though being a remarkable pianist. Anyway <laughs> – so I was just, I'm just mentioning that you, the, uh, you can, you can, I guess, uh, a lesser person could become very prideful when they have tremendous skills, you know, but anyway, but let me, let me turn. No, I mean, that's fair enough. I think, uh, as, as a musician, you know, I so say this is, this is probably one of the career hazards of, of music in yeah. general, you know. Yeah. Pride. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you have to keep it in perspective. You think, well, a musical instrument, it's, it's basically, I mean, it's a sound maker, so yeah. you, you learn to use it, and yeah, it's okay. I mean, it's, uh, man, but but it's not it's not the it's not the be all and end all in life. Yeah, you know? no, I hear you, but you are remarkable. Um, okay, so uh, just I just wanted to mention a, some some passages back in this book about humility. We kind of talked about humility in general, which is just an amazing virtue, but uh, it says here, Kempis says on page two, he says humility was a particular virtue of Christ. It is therefore feared by the devil and despised by the world. It, it is, yeah. So, I mean, like, the devil fears it. He, he does, you know? because how does the devil tempt us? A lot of the time, it's by plugging into this pride and ego and ambition, you know, and this this pride and ego gives rise to um, not only to um, wrongful desires, but also to refusal to forgive refusal to be charitable, refusal to sympathize with other people. Mm -hmm. So humility breaks down all of these. And the truly humble person um, can't be overcome by the devil because the devil has nothing to offer them mm. which could possibly distract them from virtue. Yeah. yeah. And it's despised by the world. Now we think, well, what, what's the world? The world is not used in the sense of meaning God's creation, but rather it's it's used in the sense of this kind of uh, network of, of forces and so forth. And, and this is closely aligned with the devil himself because he is described as the ruler of this world. Yeah. And it's something which the world as such um, can't come to grips with, with a truly humble person, you know, because it when, when a person is truly humble, the world doesn't have power over them. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've thought about that. I mean, like um, if you've detached from material goods, for example, you know, big, big corporate America doesn't have anything to sell you. No. <laughs> <laughs> They're powerless over you. Yeah. Yeah. So they always have to be holding out that forbidden fruit. Oh, uh, yes. You know? and, you and if you're not seeking it and you say, I'm perfectly content where I'm at, and you know, a perfectly content person is not a very good customer. No, they don't buy, no. <laughs> they don't buy and, anything. And there's this uh, tremendous freedom in, in true humility. I think we find it greatly um, in Christ's encounter with Pontius Pilate, where, mm. where he doesn't reply, he doesn't defend himself, and and Pilate is kind of thinking, well, I I can't I can't master this guy, yeah. I can't overcome him, you know. He's not defending himself. What's what's going on here? You know, and it, one of the other works you've translated for us, the Meditations. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, the Passion of the Christ through the eyes of Mary, right, yeah. uh, by Saint Anselm, which we'll talk about at some other time. But but there's a fascinating point there where. Um, the Blessed Mother is telling Saint uh, Saint Anselm um, about her perspective on the Passion, and at that moment when Christ is kind of on trial, she she expresses to Saint Anselm. She says, "You know, I, my son's such an eloquent speaker. He's so good with human beings. You know, he's going to yeah. defend himself and hopefully get out of this mess." But she then is kind of um, maybe not shocked, but. She she has to witness her son say no he's the sacrificial lamb and he doesn't he doesn't defend himself he doesn't defend himself so yeah. even at that hour where you know even Mary had hoped he would defend himself and he yeah. does not and he lets this little Roman man exercise power over him which again yeah. the, the humility of that is is just mind blowing yeah. Yeah. you know when yeah. I mean we get I get I get you know angry at somebody who cuts me off at, in the in the car you know. <laughs> And then Christ is letting Pontius Pilate condemn yeah, him to death. Yeah, yeah. 
It's uh, it's remarkable. Um, another passage that struck me, Father, is he says, Akempa says, external piety and uprightness mean nothing unless accompanied by internal humility. While humility is a ladder ascending to the highest blessedness, its absence can easily cast the soul down to hell. And what I wanted to ask you here, you know, in the Gospels, man, do I see Christ going at the Pharisees and Sadducees. Yeah. I mean, he cannot stand those empty whitewashed sepulchers. He cannot stand that fake uh, that fake humility sometimes that they show or a rigidity tied to the to the to the tradition without uh, any kind of charitable or humble spirit. I mean, when I see the stuff that really makes Jesus mad, it's that stuff. Yeah. And so, um, and I think when Akempis was writing this, he was writing it at a time in the church. Again, we talked about that revival and maybe the external piety was getting pharisaical again. Maybe there was too much emphasis yeah. on the bells and smells of everything. Indeed. And so he's emphasizing here just what Christ emphasized in the gospels, which do not be fooled that the external piety is yeah. true holiness. Oh, uh, yes. And of course, we live in a world today in which, um, which uh, well, at least in Australia, we find external piety is, is not something you see a great yeah, deal of. It's gone. So yeah, he was yeah. writing from a perspective a when external piety was, was a way in which people could advertise their own virtue. Yeah. I think we find the equivalent of external piety, though, in today's uh, society, what you might call virtue signaling. Oh, gosh, yeah. Where people talk about whatever is, you know, fashionable, uh, trendy social causes and, and everything and make like they're really um, so concerned about these things, politicians especially. And you think, well, is is this really for real? You know? Yeah. Well, you know what? We should apologize to our listeners for not listing our pronouns before we began this uh, this episode, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Talk about virtue uh, right. signaling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay, well, if you're <laughs> in, any, in, in any doubt, we're both uh, he <laughs> slash hims here. <laughs> so, no, but that's a great example. Uh, it's inclusive extern- language is another thing. I mean, people use inclusive language. I, I find, you know, most women don't care about it one way or the other. The other but what is it it's a way of people making themselves look good exactly no that's the stuff with the wokeness you know yeah. that drives us crazy yeah well it's, it's fake humility yeah, well know? that's right you know and i think i think the whole woke thing is the modern day equivalent of phariseeism yeah well that's yeah. a great connection there that's a great connection um all right i wanted to on on page six i'm going to read you a, just a, a one line the truly humble person is honestly aware of his own weaknesses and failings. He judges himself more strictly than he judges others and regrets his wrongdoings and sins constantly and sincerely. Now, why did I pick that out? Well, in studying humility, which I've done like through our other other books on humility, there's a fascinating thing to me. Holy saints, and I think Akempis was probably one of them, they very often truly believe that they're the worst of sinners. Yeah. Like, you know, and from my perspective, I'm saying, you're crazy, you know, but they truly believe it. Yeah. And, you know, in one sense, humility is supposed to be recognizing the truth. And, you know, a St. Francis de Sales or a Therese of Lisieux, they should know good and well, they're a whole lot holier than Connor Gallagher. Okay. But because of the virtue of humility, it seems like it does something to the brain to where they don't judge others but they judge themselves and they look at others and th- and they say, well, this person has this, you know, situation that's making it difficult for them. They're so compassionate towards other people around them. And they're kind of saying, okay, these people might have an excuse, but I don't have an excuse. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I, I, I guess that's how a saint can actually believe they're the worst person in the world because either they're crazy or the virtue of humility is really doing something to them to where they honestly believe they're the worst yep, person in the yep, world. Yep. And and you know, the reason that you could that we should judge ourselves with great greater strictity than uh, than other people is because we can see in our own hearts, we can see in our own minds. So, you know, we can we can uh, accuse ourselves with with honesty, with certainty. 
with other people. We don't know what's going on in their lives and hearts and so forth. Yeah. And so in charity and justice, we're bound to give them the benefit of the doubt. Right. But we can't excuse our own selves. And, and often it can be tempting to go about it the other way, you know, to, to excuse ourselves and to condemn other people. You know, but I think to take to take this opposite approach to think we're responsible only for ourselves, and this is something which um, which in one of the books of Saint Edsel he also talks about. You know, can you honestly say I feel I'm the worst of sinners? Yes, you can, because you're in only position to judge yourself. You're not really in a position to judge other people at all. It's amazing. It's amazing. And as a parent, you know, I got a bunch of little rugrats at home, and you know, the finger pointing. Is always, you know, it's his fault, it's her fault. You know, that's what kids do. I mean, adults do it worse. They just do it in more complicated ways. Yeah. So, you know, one of the, what we call the core virtues at our family is no scorekeeping. I'm always telling the kids, you can't keep score. You can't keep score. Yeah. And so, because when you live with people, you're saying, well, I did the dishes last night, it's your turn, or it's not my turn to do this, or I yeah. want to sit in the front seat of the car, you know, all these little bickerings. And they're all just little bursts of pride. And so as a dad, you know, with these little guys, I'm trying to always instill, okay, what's the humble thing to do right now? Right now, you're fighting like hell over the dishes. What's the humble thing to do? Don't don't tell me what the scorekeeping thing is to do. Don't tell me what the just thing is to do. Because that's essentially what they're always arguing is it's not fair, you know. And I'm saying, well, forget fairness. Forget scorekeeping. Forget justice, your understanding of justice. What's the humble thing to do? And when you just break it down at that level, they, they have to be honest and they admit, yeah. yeah, the humble thing to do is just to do the dishes. Okay. <laughs> you know? That's right. So That's it's right. it's 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 a it's yeah. a very practical thing. And the it, other it thing is. I'm trying to do with the kids' father is when my kids do something good, I if they have any virtue, right? If 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 somebody, adult or kid, does something that's kind, well, we know, and a campus teaches us. The virtue of humility is present within that other virtue, right? Yeah. So when my kids do something, uh, they do something kind. I'll say, oh, that's very kind and humble. Like I yeah. add and humble because, or, oh, you know, that was very brave of you. Good job to be strong and humble. Yeah. You know, so I tell them often, whatever, whenever I'm complimenting them on something, I'll try to say that it's also humble because I want to train their little brain to always see humility in the good and to see pride in the bad. Because if there's a vice, if there's anger, if there's, you know, a lack of compassion, if there's whatever, there's pride. Yeah. And if there's anything good, there's also humility. So I'm I'm always trying to push that for the little guys. Is learn to see humility in all good things and to see pride in all bad things. Yeah. Does that yeah. make any sense to you? It, it does. It it makes a lot of sense. And and you know, um, I think our in general, the world tries to link strength with pride and humility with weakness. Weak, yeah, but yeah. but but you know, I think it's really the other way around that humility arises from true strength and promotes true strength. Yeah, and pride, I think, is 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 linked with this weakness and fragility. Yeah. So yeah. you know, the cultivation of the virtue of humility um, makes us stronger people. Mm. Absolutely. It's only the, the, the truly strong person who can be truly humble. So uh, we mentioned a few minutes ago that humility, uh, the work on humility, and then the work on the elevation of the mind to God in this particular volume. There were two separate works, but we've combined them together. Yeah. And humility comes first in the book because it serves as the foundation it does. for the mind going to God. So I've turned to, I've turned to this second part of this book on the this entitled the elevation of the mind to god and the subtitle there is be still and know that i'm god i just want to read the first couple sentences i find this absolutely beautiful and so this is this is written differently this is a kempis writing to god it is you know it's like his it's like his love letter to god you know but listen to this couple first sentences i seek you my god but not through any of the senses of my body or through any perceptible images. Rather, I turn within myself to the interior chambers of my thoughts and feelings and the realm which lies beyond all thoughts and feelings. I just, I just, you know, had the comment there. I, I just find that's beautiful. I mean, this is a campus telling us exactly how he seeks God, you know, not in the stuff around, but 
truly within that interior castle, yeah, like Ter- yeah. Teresa of Avila talks about. Very much so. I mean, that this line. I mean, it could come straight out of imitation of Christ, right? I mean, it's so it's so a Kempis esque, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, but that's how he begins this elevation of the mind to God. It's by turning inward, and I just find that interesting. Yeah, yeah. So to free ourselves from the distractions of the world and and you know and, uh, and other people and everything that's going on around us, and to look within ourselves, you know, and um, we're told that the kingdom of God lies within us. I think that's such a, a beautiful and true line. This links so closely with humility and pride because pride is always something which turns us. To the outside world, it turns us to what we seem like, you know, what other people think of us, what other people are doing. Humility frees us from that and lets us move to this inner world, this world of of our own thoughts and feelings. And I think what he says so beautifully, what lies beyond thoughts and feelings. And this is where we have to go if we're going to find God. Now, is he kind of getting at what the mystical theologians would talk about, like contemplation, where, you know, God is working on the person, you know, so this isn't, yeah. it's, I don't feel like he's saying, let's think about God in the perfect way. That's not really the elevation of the mind, right? It's not no, an academic no, exercise, no, no. you know? No. So, so, you know, the, the meditation, which is where we're thinking consciously, I mean, it's a useful first step, a preparatory step to this experience of contemplation, but the contemplation happens when we le- leave behind mm. all thoughts and concepts. And, and you know it's a it's a very blessed experience which uh, which comes to most people at different times in their life, and that's that I think that's what that introductory sentence is about. He's saying go beyond these thoughts and feelings and and, yeah. and encounter God in a different yeah, place to, to leave everything behind. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. incredible. So I mean that's what elevation here refers to. It's kind of a it's an you know it's an you know so I just want I wanted the listeners to hear like that's what this work is about is encountering God yeah, and yeah, it, yeah. The, the next subheading on um, is a prayer that he, he, again, he's writing this as a prayer, right? Yep. A prayer that the mind may be freed from its bondage to the things of the physical senses. I mean, we our mind does have this bondage, you know? Yeah. And so he is, this is a, this is a Kempis's prayer to God that we get to read about how he will be freed from the trappings yeah. of this world. Yeah. Not so that he's a not just a clear thinker, but that he has an intimacy with our we, Lord. That that's that's right, you know, and and the human soul is made uh, for union with God. It has this natural upward tendency, mm. this kind of yearning for the higher things, and it's it's sin which holds us back, which entangles us in the things of this world. So, you know, if we can uh, sometimes experience this this liberation from the physical senses from the external things of the world. And this is not to say that the physical senses in themselves are evil or anything like that, but they entangle us. They hold us back. They become our masters and our prisons. Well, and so the remainder of this short volume that we've published with you, there's a lot of prayers. And are these also written by a Kempis? They are, yeah. they are. So he he wrote these prayers, I think, um, mainly for his own benefit, you know, because he he felt this this need to express himself through writing, and he would have written these prayers and revisited them at different times. So they're they're very beautiful works. I mean, you know, the the first one, the prayer of love and praise to the Blessed Virgin Mary. I mean, the, these things are absolutely beautiful. I mean. O Virgin Mary, golden rose, indescribably sweet and beautiful, let my prayers poured out to you with devotion enter into the sight of your most holy presence. I mean, he's a poet. He's a poet. And you're you're a poet as well, you know, translating this to where we can read it like that. But it's it's just, you know, uh, O most radiant star illuminating the firmament and gracious queen of heaven. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just like a love letter to Our Lady. It is. Know? It is. It, it's absolutely beautiful. And I mean, this is something which people who've only encountered Thomas Kempis through the imitation of Christ might not think about. They might think, well, it's kind of a little bit dry or, you know, not so mystical. And uh, part of the reason why I was so keen to include these devout prayers is they really um, they really illustrate the mystical side of Thomas Kempis. Yeah. And, and I think... 
Um, this uh, is is where the imitation of Christ, with its emphasis on self denial and so forth, ultimately leads us to this mystical union. So the self denial and and uh, things are not uh, like an end in themselves, but a way of freeing the soul of bringing it to this this wonderful liberty of which is the love of God. Yeah, beautiful. Well, uh, in our in our next episode, we're going to just talk about you know, in general about how, you know, kind of a summary of everything we've talked about so far in the previous episodes about how we can use Thomas Akempis in our lives, you know, in our own pursuit of holiness. But, you know, I, I highly recommend to our, our listeners and our, our customers at TAN to check out Father Nixon's translation on humility and the elevation of the mind to God. I mean, every, every page is, is a, a glorious insight. And I'm very grateful, Father, for your your work on this tremendous book. You saved this from the dungeons of time. I mean, you have brought it back and translated it for the first time into English, and uh, you know that's that's heroic in my mind. So thank you for that. And uh, any last words, Father, uh, before we uh, before we depart for today? Well, thanks very much. It's been a, a great pleasure to to speak with you today, uh, Connor, about this wonderful work. And I encourage everyone to uh, to check out the Tan Book website and, and acquire a copy of it for themselves. Outstanding. Thank you, Father. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.